Please stand with us. Between us, by the 
cross, you came and broke them down. You broke them down. And there were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. The dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is strong. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. still try to take control Cause I get scared when I can't see the end And all you want from me is to let go You're parting water Making a way for me You're I'll bring my praise before I bring my need Cause there's no fear you've not already seen I'll rest my heart on all your promises Cause I have seen and know your faithfulness
Until I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you you called my name I remember the first time somebody called me a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, disciple. Had a nice ring to it. It felt um, strong. You realized you were a part of something much bigger than yourself. Sometimes it was really, really tough. See, I, I can't begin to describe just how disorienting things were back then. I mean, one minute Jesus is telling you about uh, the gift of life, and the next minute it seems like he's just going to let us drown in the middle of the sea. <laughs> Spoiler alert, we didn't drown. It sure seemed like we were going to. Looking back on it, I realized that Jesus didn't waste a moment. I mean, he was always showing us that he was who he said he was. Which, I know, begs the question. How can we doubt him? Yeah, I tend to be the one that gets asked that more than anybody because for some reason, doubter has been connected with my name. For the record, I wasn't the only one who doubted. 
It's just, I wasn't there the day that Jesus appeared to everyone else. I, I, I was gone. And, and so I didn't, there, look, the finality of death, it has a, uh, a choking grip on all of us. And on that day that Jesus was crucified, when, um, when death swallowed him up, and then there was the day that um, they showed me his hands and the scars. And he said, Thomas, you believe because you see. But there's going to be people who believe and don't see. And that night changed everything. I mean, I was still a disciple, but now, now I was an apostle. Sent to share the good news, to tell a story. You know, there's a... Uh, there's another word, and started with a few of us, began to spread. I think it's the best word of all. It says everything that needs to be said, because we realized it wasn't about how well we believed. It was about who we believed in. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, from that moment on, we were called believers. Good morning. How you guys like our new backdrop? Pretty cool, huh? If you like it as much as I do, let Mike Birch know. He did a lot of work on that this week to make, make sure that looks as good as it does. I get to start a new series. It's our Easter series. I'm excited about it. I'm excited to, to think about a risen Savior. Amen? I'm excited. To, to Easter morning is the best morning. It may feel like Friday, but Sunday is on the way, right? We serve a risen Savior. And we're going to start talking about the characters around that that time, the people that were in contact with Jesus, the people that knew Jesus, the people that walked with Jesus, and see how the transformation happens. Understand a little bit about all of those people. They now have a new label. They may have been called disciples. They may have been called followers. They may have been called friends. But now they serve a living Savior, and they're called believers. That's what the call of the day is. Are you a believer? This whole Easter season is going to be concentrate, concentrating on that transformation of people from knowing Christ to truly knowing Christ, to believe. So that's where we're going to be at this month. Do you believe? And... Rusty said he gave me the best one, Thomas. I didn't know that until I started studying a little bit. And I told him yesterday or, or Friday, I said, I think you did give me the best one. <laughs> but let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for an opportunity that we could come into your house and we could worship you. We could praise your name. We could serve a living God, a risen Savior, Lord. Help us this season to appreciate that and help it to transform our lives. As we study your word today, help it, let it pierce our hearts that we may gain new understanding of you, that we may know that we know that we know we serve a risen Savior. Just be with us in this time. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I get to start off with Thomas. Everybody know what his first name was? That was just a test, Doubting Thomas, right? It, it, his name is, is coupled with the word doubting. 
And as I began to study this week and understand it, I'm going to tell you that's a little bit unfair to call him Doubting Thomas. So if I do anything else but you walk out of here today with a new perspective, understanding, yes, he doubted, but I don't think we should condemn him for it. So we're going to be looking at Thomas. We're going to look at what it means to doubt. Understand what it means to have questions of God. And is that okay? Is it okay for us to question God? One of the best books written by a man that I know of was written by a man named Lee Strobel. You guys probably already know the book I'm talking about. Lee Strobel wrote a book called The Case for Christ. It's one of my favorite in my library because it talks about, he starts from a point of skepticism. He starts from a point, he's a lawyer, Lee Strobel was a lawyer, and he was an unbeliever. He was a skeptic. He had questions, and he posited one question. This Jesus that everybody talks about, he is either a lunatic, a liar, or the savior of the world. And that's where he starts with his skepticism. He's one of the three. All the things that he had been told about Jesus, he's one of the three of those things. A lunatic, a liar, or the savior of the world. So he begins an investigation. He begins to explore. He interviews all kinds of people. It's a, it's a great book. I'm telling you, if you don't have a copy, I have an extra one at home. I'll be willing to loan to you or give to you if you want to read it. But he begins the process of trying to ask the hard questions, trying to ask the questions, who is this Jesus? Now I'm going to, spoiler alert, he finds out that the third of those three choices is the true one. He is the savior of the world. And his, his skepticism, his doubt, his investigation has served to bring so many people to Christ. There's millions of copies of this book have been sold, and he'll never fully understand the effect that his skepticism has had on other people and helping them to believe in Christ as their savior. I think that's way, the way I want to look at Thomas today. Thomas the Doubter. How did he get that name? How did he get that, that tag? Everybody, I mean, it, 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 it's reached into our common language, Doubting Thomas. If you're a skeptic of anything, well, you're just a Doubting Thomas. I don't think he deserves it. But let's find out how he got it. So, Christ had risen. The whole city is in turmoil. The whole city of Jerusalem is in turmoil. And um, the disciples are wondering what, what just happened. They saw Jesus walk into Jerusalem, celebrated, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The crowds welcomed him in. And in a week's time, he was tried, convicted, hung on the cross, and died. But Sunday's coming. So Sunday came. They found the tomb empty. And now the disciples are holed up in a room, afraid. They're afraid for what's going on. They don't know where Jesus is at. They just know he's not here. So, okay. So... They don't know where Jesus is at. They just know he's not with them. So our, our main text is going to be in John 20, 19 through the end of the chapter. Now I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit to some other stories and some other things. Just stick with me right there. And when you get home, I'll give you the references where all these other things that I'm going to talk about come from. And you can, you can look them up and study them. But in John 20, 19... The disciples are, 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 are in the room together and wondering what's going on. They're behind a locked door. They're a little bit afraid. And on that evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. All the disciples were there except for one, and that was Thomas. We don't know why he was there, wasn't there. We don't know where he was at. I tend to think that at that time, he was probably mourning. He was probably one of those guys that just wanted to get away and be alone and understand the events that have just taken place. I don't know that, but he wasn't there. So when he does get back, verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now if we just stay right there for just a second, he gets the bad rap. He's the doubter. But if we compare these two verses, what was he asking for? He was asking for a little bit of proof, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of, hey, show me the nail holes. Let me see the wounds in his side. And he's only asking for what the other disciples already got. And after he showed him this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Kind of makes me believe that maybe they didn't believe it yet either. That they're standing there in this room and not really fully understanding that this is the Lord, the risen Savior. So he showed him his hands, the nail-scarred hands and his side. So Thomas, doubting Thomas, was just asking for what the rest of the disciples already got. So let's understand a little bit about Thomas. Let's, let's look back and, 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 and try to get a feeling for who this guy is. Who is Thomas? The very first time we see him in the Gospel of John is in John 11. Familiar story to all of this? Jesus' friend Lazarus, Lazarus has died. He's died in Bethany. Mary and Martha, the brother of Lazarus, has told, sent word to Jesus, Come, come, my brother is dying. And Jesus held up there for a while. He didn't go anywhere. He just stayed with the disciples. Finally, Lazarus has died at this point. And there came a, a, a messenger that says, Lazarus is dead. And Jesus told them, well, let's go to him so that you may believe. All the disciples were, were around him and said, no, let's not go. Last time we were there, they stoned you. Last time we were there, they tried to take your life. Let's just hang out here. He's already dead. And Jesus said, no, let's go so that you may believe. The only one that sticks out, the only one that had any, anything else other than, hey, let's stay away from there because they stoned you last time, was Thomas, our good buddy Thomas. John eleven sixteen. Thomas says, let us go, that we may die with you. Doesn't sound like the Thomas that we think, the doubting Thomas, the one that is scared and, and, and wants proof and wants to... Sounds like somebody who truly is following Jesus, ready to go with him and die with him. Next time we see Thomas is in John 14. They're in the upper room that Passover night, and Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples and let them know about what's about to happen, that he isn't going to be with them very much longer. He knew that he was going to be crucified the next day. And he turns to them in John 14, 1, and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that, that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. 
a little bit confusing for them at this time. They're, 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 bewil- they're bewildered a little bit. What's he talking about? He's going to go away. He knows what's going to happen the next day, but they don't. And they're all just questioning and wondering. But who was it that spoke up? Who was it that asked the question? He asked, what, where are you going, Jesus? How can we go there if we don't know the way? Thomas was truly trying to understand. He wanted to know that he knew that he knew who this man Jesus was. I kind of like that about him. I kind of like the fact that he said, you know what, I'm a little bit confused right now. How do we know where you're going? He was bold enough to ask the hard question when everybody else in the room was saying, I I don't know what you're talking about. So how did his transformation from a follower to a believer begin? How do we, how, how did, it began by asking questions. It began with a little bit of doubt. It was, he was bold enough to ask the hard questions of Jesus. Thomas was not afraid to go with Jesus. He was not afraid, Lord, if you're going to die, I'm going to die with you. He wasn't afraid to go with Jesus. Thomas wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions. Thomas wanted to be certain of what he believed. That's where we're at today. Is it okay to ask the hard questions? Is, is doubt okay? First thing of our first listening point today, doubt is real. Doubt is real. We all struggle with doubt. And I'm going to jump around a little bit, but I want to take you to some places. Mark 9, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus heals the son, the demonized son of a man that that brings his son to him. So, this man's son was demonized. Um, He had uh, symptoms of convulsions and vomiting and um, no muscle control. And he brought his son and he at first, Jesus wasn't there, and he, he asked the disciples to, to heal his son. The disciples weren't able to heal him. And when Jesus came up, he said, if you can help, heal my son. If you can help, heal my son. Every parent understand, can understand these words. If you can help, heal my son. If you've had any children that have been sick, it's a scary time when your child is sick. It's a scary time to sit there and know that maybe you can't do anything about it. Some doubt might come in your mind. Every parent understands these words. So he asked Jesus, if you can help, heal my son. Jesus goes on to tell him, it just takes you to believe. It takes you to believe. Believe that it can happen. And what was his response? His response was immediate, and he cried out, and he says, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Now, that sounds a little bit, what does he mean, help me with my unbelief? I'm sure that even as believers, we have doubts sometimes. We have probably said, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Probably doesn't sound exactly like that, but maybe it sounded, Lord, I believe, but my heart is filled with doubt. Or maybe it sounded like, Lord, I know you can, but I'm not sure you will. 
Lord, the situation seems hopeless. Help me to trust you. If we've ever been in those low points and we don't have a full understanding and, and we, situations come about, we may experience doubt. Doubt is not a bad thing. Sometimes we think that doubt is the opposite of faith. If I have doubts, I must not have faith. I want to rearrange that a little bit today. Without doubt, faith would be unnecessary. If we knew all of the answers to all of our questions about the mysteries of God, we would be in heaven. The day that we know all of the mysteries of the gospel message and all of the mysteries of God is the day that we're in the presence of our Lord. That's the only time we're going to know it, right? So in order to have faith, we have to have a little bit of doubt. We have to have some questions because without questions, faith would be unnecessary. So when we look at Thomas and we say doubting Thomas, doubt is kind of a badge of, of honor. It's going to Jesus and being bold enough to say, I don't understand all that that you've said. I don't understand all of the things that you are. Help me understand. Help me believe. Help me trust you. Just like that father, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. So going, we're going to move to our second, our second point. So doubt is okay. We have to understand that doubt is real. Our second point is seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Now, I'm going to tell you, would you believe me if I told you that I was a long-distance bicycler? You guys probably wouldn't believe that. Maybe you'd look at me and say, yeah, right. Well, it's been a couple years since I've done that. <laughs> and I, I will get back there, I promise. But when I was 50 years old, I turned 50 and I said, you know what, this bicycling thing, I am going to bicycle across the state of Missouri. And go ahead and throw that picture up. That is me about five years ago. My tire is in the Mississippi River. The week started with my tire in the Missouri River and in five days, I went 320 miles across the state, and there's my proof. Seeing is believing. My tire is, I made it. So seeing is believing. You guys believe me now? <laughs> so on that day, that morning, when Jesus was not in the tomb, Mary had come back and said, he's not there. And the other disciple who came in John 28, then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and he believed. The other disciple was John. He was the fastest runner. He tells us that he, he outran Peter. But why did he run? Why didn't he just say, Mary... Okay, the tomb is empty. Because he had to see for himself. He had to see so that he could believe. So he ran to the tomb and said, what did he find? What did he find in the tomb? Nothing. Jesus wasn't there. He had risen. That's when he believed. He saw and he believed. He saw the empty tomb and he believed. In Mark 16, 6, 16, 6, an angel came and said, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is, prison, he is risen. He is not here. See the place where he, they laid him. 
The challenge was go into the tomb, find the empty tomb, and understand and believe. So if we come back to Thomas, seeing is believing. Come back to Thomas, and we're back in John 26 through 28. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. So he was with them this time. It's a week past now. The disciples are still holed up. They're still cowering away a little bit, trying to figure out what's going on. But Thomas was with him. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand in the place and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. We don't even know. It doesn't say that he actually reached out and touched the wounds in Jesus' hand or the wounds in his side. But at that point, he believed. He understood. He knew. His question, he was questioning God. He was saying, I want to see it from my own eyes. Seeing is believing. I want to know. We not, ought not to be afraid to come to God with our questions. Our church ought to have a sign out front. Every Christian church ought to have a sign out front that says, Doubters welcome. Doubters welcome. It's okay. Jesus knows our doubts. We ought to have a sign that says, If you have doubts, come inside. If you have questions, come inside. If you are uncertain, come inside. If you are a skeptic, come inside. If you are searching for truth, come inside. Because what we find is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to us what Jesus was to the disciples. He is the witness to us that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is God. And, he does, and God is not afraid of your doubts. When Thomas said, you are my Lord and my God, he didn't say it with excitement and surprise. He, it wasn't a cry of astonishment. It was a flat conviction. He might as well said, two plus two is four. He might as well have said, the sun in the sky, or that big ball of fire in the sky is the sun. It was a flat pronouncement of what he knew that he knew. You are my God. You are my Lord and my God. It's the first time in John that Jesus is addressed without a qualifier. It wasn't he's the son of God. It wasn't, it, it was you are my God. You are my Lord and my God. So Thomas doubted. He asked. He asked the hard questions. And Jesus showed up and said, I have an answer for your doubt. I have an answer See my hands. See my side. And I, 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 th I, think, I think Thomas was already there. But his proclamation is, I see it. You are my Lord and you are my God. He transformed to a believer. Our third point is the encounter is personal. Following in verse 29, Jesus said to them, You have believed because what you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I don't think 
that that was a, 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 him correcting Thomas as much as it was him blessing us. Who are the people they have not seen and believed? Who's, it, who's Jesus talking about? The people who have not seen and believed. It's us. Jesus was taking this moment to tell Thomas, I'm here. But he was also taking this moment to bless us and say, blessed are you who believe and haven't seen. Because that's where faith comes. That's where our faith takes over. We can believe. So, before John closes out his gospel, we can leave the story right there and understand that Thomas had a transforming, a transforming moment that he knew what he believed. He knew that he knew that he knew. But don't, John wants to close it out. And in 30 and 31, now Jesus said, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So in other words, what happens to Thomas is exactly what John hopes will happen to each and every one of us when we read this story. That we reach a moment where we've come and we have doubts, we have skepticism, we have questions, and we bring them to the cross so that he can give us the answers and we can know that we know what we believed. If you stand with me, I'd like to pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word and thank you for Thomas and thank you for the example that you've given us that it's okay. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to understand that we don't have the answers. The day we have the answers is when we will be in the presence of you, Lord. Help us to know that we can come to the cross with our questions. We can come to the cross with our skepticism. We can come with our doubts that you are big enough for all of them. Help us to, 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 to not be afraid to ask the hard questions. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here today And you have some troubles, you have some doubts, you have some questions. God never turns away an honest doubter. Never. Come to him with your doubts, your skepticism, your unbelief, your hard questions, your sincere uncertainties. He welcomes them. He's big enough for them. So if you're here today and you need to come and say, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. We'd love to have a chance to pray with you. But maybe you're here today and you have never said, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. You've never vocalized that. You've never understood that. Let this Easter be the day, the, the, the Easter morning that you wake up knowing that you save, serve a risen Savior. It can't be said any simpler than in Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So if you're here today and you want to make a commitment that says, I believe, help me with my unbelief, I invite you to come down. Maybe you're scared to come down. Maybe you don't, don't maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is t speaking to you right now to come. Grab that person next to you. I'm sure they'll be happy to come with you. They'll celebrate it, in fact. Won't you come? 
Won't you say, I believe, help me with my unbelief. This time we'll take an offering. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and bless this offering. Lord, we're just so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. Multiply this offering to your use for your service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lots of things going on, folks. If you didn't pick up a listening guide, make sure you get one. Just a couple additions. Uh, the uh, Rusty's preaching at uh, the First Baptist Church at Colt Camp this week. So uh, there's several of us that are going to go down and support him starting tonight. Uh, the youth is not going to meet here at the church. They're going to meet at the First Baptist Church in Colt Camp. It's out on F Highway just south of town, right at the edge of town. So they're going to meet there about 530. I think we're going to have a hot dog uh, uh, dinner and uh, services start at 630. If you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to have each and every one of you. Uh, disaster relief training. Yellow is really not my color, but to, to support that next weekend, starting on Friday, there's a group of uh, individuals here from the church that are going to travel up to Chillicothe for uh, disaster relief training. They do that three or four times a year, uh, but if you could be a part of that, we've got about 15 people from the church that are signed up to do that. If you'd like more information, Tim Murdoch's out front, and there's a sign-up list out there. We'd love to have each and every one of you. If you've never, if you've not been a part of that, the opportunity to serve there, uh, you'll you'll bring back so much more than what you give it just by serving people and, and following Christ in that way. But again, that's Friday and Saturday on April the eighth and ninth, and they'll leave. They're planning on leaving the church about noon. But there's more information in the sign up sheet out front on that. And then uh, let's not forget April the 10th, which is next Sunday. We're going to be taking up a love offering for Ukraine relief. We're partnering with a local church here uh, <clears throat> that has made contact with the Ukrainian church that is doing uh, disaster relief for those people over there, trying to help the people and, and exit them, keeping them out of harm's way. And so uh, we as a church are uh, going to take up a love offering next Sunday on April the 10th. So pray about that, think about that, and be prepared for that. Uh, other than that, uh, no gals of promise on the 15th. So just pick up a listening guide about everything else is in there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and be dismissed. Father God, just so thankful for the many blessings you've given us. Thankful for this church, thankful for the pastors and the support staff that it takes. Lord, just so thankful for each and every one that come and attend. Bring them back next week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.